Well, thank everybody uh, for uh, taking your time today. Um, I know this is kind of a uh, first introduction to our company. Hopefully some of you have heard of us before um, because we've been around for a long time, but we, we sometimes uh, tended uh, to be more of a quiet company kind of you know, working as a, an OEM developer and we've, we've developed quite a bit of technology that has been sort of behind the scenes. So um, a lot of products that I'm sure you have seen, you have probably reviewed and, and uh, commented on, um, included products that Addo has made over the many, many years. So, um, you know, one of, the, one of the big things that we're doing now is kind of breaking out and, uh, you know, trying to get our, our, our larger visibility with people. And, and it's really exciting to talk with, uh, a lot of a lot of yourselves because certainly uh, you hold a, a lot of prestige in the industry and um, certainly over in Europe um, it's it's great to get some some good feedback um, and some uh, what your view of the world is because certainly things are always different uh, as 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 we I go around the world and talk to different people and get their perspectives. So I, I absolutely you know really appreciate this and thank you to A3 Communications for. Um, inviting us to this event. And hopefully, um, as we roll through this, uh, we'll have some questions um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some answers um, that, that, uh, that'll be better than what I just answered last time or didn't answer. So um, with that, let me, let me kind of uh, move us down to the, if I can, what's going on here? There we go. Okay, so um, I, I'm, I'm introducing myself. So I'm Tim Klein. Um, I am actually one of the co-founders of Addo, um, so I've been here the whole time. Um, so I can kind of take you through history and different types of products. Um, they kicked me out of engineering 20 something years ago, um, but uh, I, I do have a technical slant to me. Um, Peter Donnelly uh, is our director of products, so he is in charge of all of our various product lines. Um, and Ken Seibert is uh, our customer engineering manager, and he works with um, uh, all of our customers and partners from a technical side. Um, they are on the line. We also have several other people that are in the audience uh, from Addo. So if we, uh, we roll into some other areas that might be uh, more uh, slanted toward their direction, we can certainly uh, connect uh, them into have a conversation as well, okay? So I'm gonna go through and give you kind of an overview because people don't really probably know much about us. Um, you know, your, your classic, I'll call it company presentation, but we do have some technology that we'll talk about, uh, some of the things that differentiate us in the marketplace, um, things that, uh, uh, you know, make, make Addo Addo and why do customers, you know, use us and, uh, uh, come to us and, and what's kept us around for 30 some odd years, right? Um, we have some use cases on, on how some of our customers use our products. And then of course, uh, uh, we, we have some time that we can show you uh, just how we actually do some of the, the, the products that we do um, as a whole, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna go through these because I think you, you probably have more questions as we get into the technology and product lines. Um, so I, I will try and move through this quickly, but you know, certainly you, you flag me or, or you know, ask me anything as we go. Um, okay. So as I said, uh, we're actually located here uh, near Niagara Falls, uh, New York. So we're, uh, even though we're in New York, a lot of people think we're in New York, New York. We're not, we're in uh, actually near Buffalo or Niagara Falls, New York. Um, we, we have a, a pretty, experienced team of, of engineers. Um, more than uh, two thirds of our company is engineers. Um, we've been around and together for a long time. Our, our longevity is probably 14, 15 years, um, average uh, tenure uh, for our technical team. So that's one of the things that allows us to move very, very quickly. Um, 
we do, we are a classic manufacturer in that we do all of our design software um, product build out, but we use subcontractors to actually build the product. Um, then we bring it in and do final um, assembly, final testing, configuration, flashing, packaging uh, for our various customers. Um, as we go through this, we'll talk a little bit about um, our product lines, but, but you can think of our products as two separate categories. We, we um, make host adapter product lines. So that's fiber channel, SAS. Um, uh, the, uh, we also do NYX as part of that uh, uh, portfolio, um, NVMe adapters and Thunderbolt uh, adapters. And we also make various appliances. So we make products uh, that do bridging from various protocols, um, the fiber to SAS or such, ethernet to SAS. Um, we also have um, some new products that we're rolling out, um, which is a, a solid state disk uh, appliance, as well as some various uh, controller technology um, that go embedded into um, JBOFs and, and some of those things. Okay. Tim, Tim um, you, you mentioned, yeah. uh, you said classic manufacturers. So I, I guess most of the actual manufacturers offshore and then what you bring into the States for testing, is that right? Uh, we build all of our product in uh, in New York. Uh, ah. uh, actually, sorry, in uh, um, the U.S. Between uh, ah, was, that was, okay. That was going to be my next question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So everything is actually um, on site. Um, well, local. I'll put it that way. Right. Uh, so interesting. Interesting. Yeah. 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 The economic. Well, it, it was a trade off. It's a trade off between yeah. um, some quality. Um, levels, right? We, we can get to the manufacturers to be able to do that. Um, and in general, we tend to do um, a lot of different configurations for companies, uh, depending on what they need. Um, so it, it's uh, it, between the shipping costs and travel costs, it's actually uh, more cost effective for us to be able to do it locally. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was going to be my uh, next question. Thanks for yeah, useful to uh, useful to hear that kind of thing because I think there's going to be a lot more of that will happen in the future. Yeah, well, you know, it was interesting because we didn't get really um, uh, it didn't really impact us much on the whole thing that we went through the last several years, which uh, tariffs and um, you know, hey, you got to pull manufacturing back into the states because we were already there. So um, that that actually worked out okay. Um, other than components, right? So that's always a, uh, a challenge on that side. Um, so, so like I said, we do, uh, we sell most of our product to OEMs. Um, so probably 80% of our business goes through OEMs and that's why you may or may not have heard of us. But uh, as I say, um, a lot of companies um, that you're probably used to their, their products had our stuff in there. Um, so we have, uh, we sell all over the world. We do have um, some worldwide distribution. Uh, most of these are, are value add distributors around the, the world. Um, we have uh, currently in field, probably about 50,000 um, uh, end users that are using our products. Um, some of them may not even know that are using it, but uh, um, that's, that's uh, what OEM companies do, right? Um, so, so we have two types of customers. Um, they tend to fall into, they're either manufacturers of, of uh, computer products, right? Um, or they tend to be application specific companies. So these are companies that may be building out uh, imaging um, stations or uh, media and entertainment environments or um, doing some AI um, type of integration, right? So. So we, we kind of work in both of those. So, you know, our technology, we tend to work with partners that um, in that space where they may be expertise uh, or experts in uh, like media entertainment. They may be experts in media entertainment with very sophisticated engineers in there, but they don't necessarily know storage or they're not network experts. And so that's where we kind of work with them to complement their um their overall engineering staff. So we always look at us as an extension of our, our partners OEMs, right? Uh, most of our, our customers um, long-term, right? So we've been working with companies for, you know, 15 years plus. Uh, some of them actually been around since we originally started. 
Um, but we tend to, um, you know, uh, multiple generations of products with them. Okay. Um, you can see some of the various markets that we play in. Um, again, you'll, you'll see as we, we talk a little bit more about some of our technology, why our, our uh, customers in these markets select Addo over them. Um, main, main difference being here is that Addo really does focus on more real-time managed latency environments um, versus our, our competitive side. So here's our timeline. I, I know it's kind of like, wow, that's a lot, um, but we've been around a lot, right? Um, we were actually um, founded making solid state disks. So it was kind of interesting. We used to compete with Digital Equipment Corporation making uh, SCSI based solid state disks. And we, we did, uh, um, we sold those into a lot of unique applications. Um, a lot of it was early pre-press and printing and imaging and uh, things that we're looking for, again, real time, very fast storage. Um, and, and, but, but we've done all different types of products. So if you've used tape libraries that were, uh, they had SCSI tape, tape drives in them, um, we were all the bridges that, that uh, were in the tape libraries that converted them to fiber channel or ethernet. So, so that was in Quantum, uh, Overland, uh, ADIC, um, Sony, NEC, Fujitsu. Um, basically, I think there was 12 uh, tape library manufacturers that we do, did bridges for. Um, and then those extended out. So they were sold through Sun and EMC and um, IBM and et cetera, et cetera. So we did a lot of that technology. Um, we've built products here where we were host adapters and we built actually storage uh, boxes themselves that were used uh, with Unisys uh, stealth program. Um, so uh, we were the, we actually sold them the whole technology thing, host adapters, software, um, specialty bridges, fiber channel um, hubs, um, and actually a, a full storage rack that we designed uh, for OEMs that was all PADA connected um, to fiber channel back in the 90s. So, you know, we, we've been on the, the edge of a lot of technology. Um, again, we, 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 we tend to help those uh, companies kind of move uh, some of that technology along. Okay. Um, we, we talked about so so what markets and, and you know where do we play? Um, obviously, when we we are out there with our our cards, so we make for instance fiber channel host adapters. Well, we compete with Broadcom and Marvell, right? The old uh, Emulex and QLogic people. So we're 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 the third guy in that market. Um, we're also the third guy in the market for the SAS cards. So you know you have again Broadcom, um, Microchip, which is the Adaptech line, Addo. Right, um, we're the third guy in there, and we also do Ethernet products, right? So, so there's a we're we're out there competing with billion dollar companies, um, and, but one of the reasons that why why Addo is selected in a lot of these applications is is our focus is really on um, uh, streaming and low latency environments where where real time is very very important. So. Um, one of the things that Addo tends to do is we really need to guarantee data delivered at a certain time. And that is really hard to do um, in, in a lot of applications. So as we do that, our latency shrinks and we get very, very tight tolerances, which actually make us better when you build us into IT environments. Okay. Um, you, you'll hear my, my statement, uh, I tell our team all the time, it's, it's not necessarily how fast you move the data, but how smooth you move the data, because moving it smooth actually increases the overall throughput of your overall system, right? It's like balancing uh, performance in a system, okay? Everybody likes the pictures, you know, we, you'll, you'll see that we, we've, have, we've been around for a long time, so we have a lot of different companies that we've worked with here. Um, and build product for. Um, you can see their, their tier one storage um, applications, their big companies, small companies, um, companies in different market segments, different categories, but they all have one thing in common, which is they're, they're building uh, systems that have, have very, very tight tolerances that they need to be able to do for delivering data. 
Hey, Tim, can I interrupt you yeah. for a second? This is Pete. Yep. Um, there's a lot of chatter on the um, on the chat, and I just wanted to pause for a second to see if yeah. anybody had a question directly for Tim on some of the questions or, or even some of this material. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll chip in quickly to do yeah, with, um, and just what I was saying on the chat about computational storage. There's a huge amount of interest. Um, DPUs, I would suggest, are one aspect of computational, probably the dominant one right now. But I'd be interested to know what Atto's take is on this new area, and also whether you're interested in working with industry associations like SNEA to provide a set of consistent um, interfaces between these uh, DPU devices, uh, computational storage devices, and, and the external world. There's quite a bit of technical work going on in that area at the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, interesting, I actually, actually I have a slide on, on some GPU stuff that we do. Um, so we've been working with NVIDIA for, I don't know, maybe five years um, on being able to uh, take data directly from um, the GPUs and transfer it directly into um, storage and uh, back from storage, bypassing the whole CPU and system level. So I think uh, you know our 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 product technology branding we call is um, direct to GPU. Um, it's it's really about uh, DMAing the stuff directly in in and out, right? Um, and uh, we have some some customers that are able to to really get some extra performance out of that. Um, so there was a lot of coding stuff that we have worked with uh, NVIDIA on, um, you know, taking this into uh, industry standards. Um, uh, that's something that we, we haven't really participated in, but um, could be something that we do in the future here. Yeah, we see GPUs as, right? I mean, they're, they're all about real time, all about real time. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting, even some of the companies that we worked with many, 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 many years ago, did all custom type of programs um, and built their own system boards prior to NVIDIA and that whole GPU um, acceleration. So a lot of that same technology that we did back in the early 90s, you know, we've been able to propagate all the way through and now we're seeing some advantages in the whole AI world on that. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to take away from, uh, from Pete and his uh, portion of the presentation, but I think we'll go into a little bit more detail on how we can transfer data from block storage directly into um, GPU memory and back um, very, very quickly. And, and that's something that sets Addo apart from our competition. Good. Yeah, real quick, there was a question about the slide. Um, I mean, there are some names on here that actually are no longer <laughs> Uh, but this is, once again, just representative of companies we work with over the last 30 years. So just, just a comment. Some of them have been bought out, rolled in, moved on, but it's kind of giving us a splattering of different companies that we've worked with. So yeah, good. All right. All right. I'll roll through. Again, end users, everybody loves to see different end users, but we work with uh, two, two sides of the, the companies, right? We do a lot with OEMs, but we also you know, work closely with um, end users because when we work with end users, we're able to find out what their needs are and where they're going. And, and from a technology side and storage, um, it, it helps us to build better products for OEMs because again, our, our OEM partners, rely on us to be able to tell them, hey, where are things going and what are those needs for those customers? Um, so it, it's, it's kind of a, a nice little um, ecosystem that we've worked with for years on this. Okay. So I think uh, this is probably where, you know, more discussions will probably uh, ensue. So I thought uh, we could talk about this, but before I do that, you know, just to kind of give you a little more detail of, of what types of products Addo makes. Um, so, you know, as I said, on the, on the left-hand side is, is our, our appliance line. On our right-hand side is what we do is what I classify as our host adapter line. Um, it's uh, uh, our Express SaaS is our SaaS 
product line, as you can see, Celerity is our fiber channel line. Um, okay, this just kind of gives you an overview of different things that we do. Okay. Yeah, I, just a you know maybe yep. a pause here is, you know, it'd be interesting for many of the folks who are on the line. Uh, I'm just curious how many of those, how many of you, are, are familiar with that? Oh, uh, have you heard of us? Have you used our equipment in the past? Um, just trying to see if we can get maybe a show of hands on that. Hey, Tom, we use uh, Addos in our test lab all the time to test other products and for, for performance. So very familiar. Good, good, good. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, people have heard of us uh, in the media entertainment market, which is one of our primary markets. However, you know, probably more of our business actually is on the IT side and data centers. So that's why it's uh, just interesting to hear. Uh, and also our products typically are embedded within our customer solutions. So we're under the hood. It's kind of the Intel inside. It's the Addo inside. So anyway, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, a, a lot of people um, may be familiar with the Addo disk benchmarks. Um, we literally get millions of downloads uh, a month out of those things. It's, it's incredible how many, uh, how many people download it and use that thing every, uh, every month. So um, you may have heard of us from that side. So, so you know, our, our products, as we say, right, we really focus on bandwidth and latency environments. Um, and our product lines use those two um, differentiators you know, it's, it's right from our design process of, okay, when we, when we build uh, products, when we select um, chipsets, when we select um, types of connectors, um, writing our software, everything is all focused around, you know, this latency management and bandwidth, which is really kind of interesting because um, the reason why we focus on this is, is when we first started, I told you that we started manufacturing solid state disks. And so we actually ended up making host adapters because we couldn't find any uh, host adapters that were fast enough to show off our solid state disks. Because most controllers, what they do is they do an IO, right? Um, or they do a series of IO. And while the disk is out there figuring out, you know, um, where it is and seeking and, and doing their, their big lengthy access time, all the other software drivers were cleaning up whatever happened before. Well, when you're selling solid state disks, you can't do that. You have to be able to deliver that data instantaneously, make a decision, and then do it all over again as quickly as possible, right? Um, and so as we were looking at and working with a lot of the HBAs, um, we found that not to be the case. And that's why, you know, sometimes uh, customers will see 20, 30, 40% uh, difference in performance when they're using our products versus our competitors who, who are, you know, obviously, you know, market leaders um, with respect to volume, but not necessarily on performance. Okay. So this is, this is one of the core technologies, I, 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 as I alluded to earlier, right? This is about you know, how do you provide smooth data performance versus um, uh, just trying to blast data across? So I, I use the, uh, oh, I'll have, to, I'll have to switch it up here. So um, I use the analogy of you could go 100 kilometers an hour, I'll use kilometers instead of miles, 100 kilometers uh, an hour uh, down the street. But if you have to stop at every stoplight, um, that's not going to be as efficient as maybe going 85 and being able to just smoothly go through every uh, light because they're timed properly. Um, and that's the type of stuff that actually raises your overall performance of a system because as, as you guys know, systems are all about balancing, right? You can have something that's really fast CPU, but if you can't feed the data into it fast enough, all that CPU power is, is gone to waste or vice versa. You can have very, very fast storage Right, but you know the system itself can't handle it. So, so balancing those becomes critical when you're doing real-time environments, and you know that translates directly into data center applications as well. Okay. 
Um, this is another area that uh, Addo works in um, uh, called uh, Multipath Director. So one of the things that we do is we can provide uh, connectivity not only to um, servers and server environments, um, but we also do a lot with the tier ones on connecting in workstations. So we, we bring um, a lot of these workstation as an environment directly into managing storage via a SAN. So when you think of environments like media and entertainment or oil and gas exploration or um, imaging or any of these type of things, they need very, very fast access to those data files. Um, and, and they don't want to send it through a server and then out have it served from a server, they literally need to be able to work at very, very high rates of speed directly with that storage. So Addo has a product um, uh, software core to our, our HBA technology where we, we actually deliver um, uh, multi-pathing connectivity to these things. But it, it's different than what you'll even see in servers because we cut layers out of the operating system um, driver set so that we can deliver the, the, the data very, very smooth and efficient to those type of environments, okay? We also build target mode drivers. So in a lot of um, uh, storage boxes or application boxes that wanna connect to that high-speed uh, storage uh, or high-speed networks, whether it's uh, Ethernet or um, uh, SaaS or fiber channel or something like that, uh, we have a full full line of, of target mode. So not only do we support all the industry standard um, uh, drivers uh, and, and protocols, but we also have our own set of target mode, which, which again, eliminates layers to make it more efficient for our customers. Okay. We see this quite a bit, uh, whether it's folks who just don't want to pay for branded storage and want to develop their own or folks who have applications. And this is probably a bigger use case for us, folks who have uh, applications where they need particular performance profiles, particular um, management interfaces. Um, so we have a pretty large practice when it comes to target mode drivers to support that storage side of the business. Yeah, good. All right. So, so here was that, uh, that, here's a nice picture. It's a little easier to explain it with GPUs. Um, as you can see, with, without, uh, without our, our direct to GPU, uh, most GPU data is actually double transferred, if you want to think of it that way. You transferred it through the CPU to system memory, then out of the system memory into storage. Um, and, and with our, our technology, we're literally delivering it from storage to GPU and, and vice versa. And, and we have actually seen um, CPU utilization, you know, drop considerably um, in applications or um, being able to up the a number of GPUs that they can add into a system to be able to, um, uh, you know, uh, improve their overall application. And it's really interesting because we can take, instead of people buying, you know, very, very expensive servers, we have one customer that, that was buying you know, $25,000, $30,000 servers for their application um, to be able to get the performance that they need. And they were able to move it from, a, from that level server down to something that was like a four or $5,000 server, which meant that they were able to add more GPUs um, and more storage uh, to their overall application, which just changed the whole dynamics of the, the cost structure for them. So that was really, really a, an interesting, um, model that happens okay yeah just just to add to that tim um si since we don't have a use case um at the end for direct to gpu a little bit more about some of the customers um i can give you a specific example um, of a customer that was using direct to gpu technology to take data um so image data off of SaaS storage in this case um, and they were bringing that in and, and manipulating that in system memory, which is double buffered, like Tim mentioned. Um, and then they would have to transfer that data out. Um, what we allow them to do is take these 4K, um, you hear about 4K all the time now, um, and even all the way up to 8K images. And what they were doing is they were devouring um, video. So they were taking these images in of old films 
and make taking the noise out of the film, um, making the images um, look much clearer, less artifacts, and upconverting them. And they couldn't do that with the current CPU and system memory architecture. Um, we enabled that by allowing them to directly access GPU memory from our SAS drivers. So really interesting application for that customer. Yeah, and we see this uh, really starting to pick up over the last several years. And um, we see this as one of the, the driving factors for um, the next uh, 10 years. So, so is it? Question on that use yeah. case, Kenneth, is that, was there any application change, code change necessary? Um, and and how, how big of a lift was that? Since you're nodding. I, yeah, <laughs> that, 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 that's a good question. Um, it, it wasn't a very big lift. Um, what we do is we provide an interface to customers. Um, it's basically an API and instead of making standard memory calls, um, they use our API to access the pin GPU memory. Um, and, you know, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a little bit of development on the application side, but it really proved huge benefits when trying to debower these videos. So they were very, very impressed with it. So are you seeing that yes. trickle down to the, the um, various um, broadcasting vendors, software vendors changing some of their code to enable this? So that's, that's one of the things that we've done. I mean, we've, we've taken this out to several customers at NAB. We've had lots of conversations with the, with the bigger players like Adobe, Avid, Apple, Autodesk. Um, and the way their video pipeline works today, they would have to do some integration work. So we're kind of weighing the benefits and the pros and the cons of, of what they can do with this technology. Um, and how it can push the levels of performance for their customers. Um, this is really for high-end video. Um, you know, when you're talking 4K, 8K at high frame rates, or when you're manipulating uh, video images. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Just to add on to that too, it's it's not simply a matter of um, video manipulation um, we found benefits with uh, with some database applications as well so there's a variety of different applications and, and we're working with all those application vendors so so you know these are just kind of gives you a kind of a flavor here for some of the things that we do um, again adding adding some of our technical expertise um, and to select problems that co companies have, like, hey, you know, we can't get the data fast enough. Uh, you know, the, the second one I have on the screen, it talks about right stop, which is, you know, a forensics company uh, came to us and said, hey, we have this problem of when we're doing forensic analysis, right? So um, our, our police force will go out and uh, take a laptop and then do, uh, you know, download everything that they have off of the drives. But whenever we do that, you know, it leaves uh, remnants out on the drive that the drive was, was actually read, right? Uh, and so what we need you to do is to build some things into your, your environment to guarantee us that no rights are going out to the drive. So the drive is, is totally intact. Um, it, it's it's uh, but again, this is one of those type of applications where we will work with companies to um, optimize or or adjust um, or put specialty things in there for for companies that that you know our big uh, big competitors just wouldn't even consider doing for them. Okay. Um, other other types of things. So we talk about a lot of our customers. Um, maybe again experts in their field so they may be a, a media specialist or an imaging specialist or a you know right any anything that's an unstructured data type of uh, of specialist but not a storage or networking expert um, and one of the things that we do is is we actually go through and do some optimizations so that it's easy for people to install and uh, connect I, i'm sure all of you have, have heard these stories which is Oh, I went out and I spent all this money on buying these very fast, uh, you know, connections. And but when I plug them in, I'm just not seeing the, the level of performance that I bought. Or, gee, I, I, I spent all this money and, you know, gee, this thing is supposed to be 10 times faster than, you know, from an interface. But 
I'm only seeing a, a slight increase. What's going on? And a lot of that is how systems are set up, how they're configured. And you know, as we talked about before, it's all about balancing. And so we have some tools and interfaces. And I believe this is something that Ken's going to kind of show you um, some of the things that we do and build in to help our customers make it so easy to, to connect um, these high performance ethernet on this one, but we also have something similar for fiber channel as well. Yeah, yeah, Tim, absolutely. So we're gonna, at, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna give you all a demo of the Addo 360 software suite, what it does, what it does for our customers. And uh, I'll set a few examples of how we save customers a lot of time and uh, increase their revenue and their ability to get online quicker. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in the demo session. Good, but, but this still gives you a good overview of the types of things that Addo does as we build it in. Now, just before you leave that slide, yep. if I may, mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned monitoring there and analytics and giving people advice on how to change. What sort of people are you giving this advice to? Are they specialists in storage? Are they specialists in data manipulation? Or are they the application generalists that you were discussing before? Um, so, so really good question. Um, trying to think of how to answer that. So Addo 360 allows users that are, um, you know, application users to simply one click configure, or um, we provide some very simple diagnostics for your basic end user. Um, mm -hmm. but there's layers of 360 and, and you'll see in the demo how we take it down in ethernet layers that we actually can take it all the way to socket memory level. And that could be used by a data center or a network engineer. And I presume that these capabilities can be throttled and linked by the user identity of the person actually running the software to stop an amateur or a generalist, you know, really doing something daft at a very low level? Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so this is, this is all that, you know, you, you can password protect all this stuff. So the customer wouldn't go in and say, okay, let's just bring the whole network. Down. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, uh, we also have something very similar um, that we actually build into our appliances. So as part of our appliance line, we actually um, have a, a specialty controllers in there that we've designed that actually can tell you, you know, what's happening real time um, within the bridge, for instance. So we can tell you what's happening on the storage connectivity side, what's happening on the, the, um, uh, the actual drive side of it and what's happening in the middle. And we, we can take measurements down to um, 100 nanosecond slices. And why that is important is, is most people, when they look at performance analytics um, or system level performance, they're looking from the server all the way down to the storage. That means that if they're looking from the um, through multiple layers of operating system and driver stacks, right? Then they have to see what's going on uh, uh, through a switch, right? And then to the storage controller and then to the drive and then all the way back in order to find out, hey, what's my actual performance? By putting our products in the middle, you know, we actually can tell you what's going on at, at, at a, a whole different perspective um, from an analytics tool. And, and it really helps um, solve some very, very large scale SAN connectivity networking problems um, for visibility. But again, I'm just, I'm just sharing some, some, this is what the types of stuff that Addo thinks of when we build out our products. It's not just a, a, a bridge, right? There's a bridge with some real um, high level value in, in doing some of these things. Okay. Sort of going back for a second to Tim's, um, Tim had a slide earlier. Um, we have an unhealthy obsession with latency and bandwidth optimization. Um, our feeling is that um, latency and, and, and being very particular about uh, maintaining latency and uh, and maximizing the bandwidth is important for our customers. And, and that's really how all these technologies fit. Not only do are we able to maximize it, we're also 
as Tim's pointing out here with these tools, able to show users um, how their, ba their bandwidth is being used, show people to a very detailed level, um, you know, what their latencies are. So it really helps people understand what's going on in their storage infrastructure, as well as, as manipulate it. When, when you're building up that history of knowledge that the customer has, are you also planning to give them any modeling type capabilities? So instead of just seeing what's going on now and diving in to try and remedy something or to improve it, but actually give them some ideas on how far they can push things to keep a consistent level of latency rather than absolutely the, the best so that they can actually do some predictive work as well as just, you know, what's happening now, what happened yesterday? Yeah, it's right now. It's a, it's a, it's a very, early, it's very early. But um, adding uh, artificial intelligence into our tools is something that we're absolutely working, working with, to be able to help people model it, understand it, and actually do some predictive, uh, predictive uh, behavior determinations as well. So we're, we're looking at all that stuff. Great. So, so here's a, a, something similar we do with uh, uh, VMware, or a different, again, something different than you know what our competitors do to be able to help customers uh, um, figure out how do they get the, the best uh, performance value. So, Pete, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this over to you so you can kind of go a little deeper on some of the products and roadmaps, and um, you know, I'm I'm really interested in getting some feedback from. Um, all of you too on on uh, wh where where we should be looking at you know taking some of these products in the future and things like that. Uh, right. um, is there any other questions that I can answer at least from the from the high level um, where we go to the next section and feel free? It looks like there have been a lot of questions asked in the chat, and uh, your team is doing an amazing job of keeping up with them and replying as well. Um, although Mary has just proven me wrong and she's asking a question right now. Um, oh, and Peter has replied. See, your team is ahead of the game. So um, I'll, 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 just, I'll just leave them to it because it seems they've got it absolutely in hand. So, Tim, why don't you stop sharing here and then I'll share my screen. You've got it. Okay, there he is. So let me get started a little bit talking about products. You know, Tim's taken us through who we are as a company. He's taken us through uh, what are the technologies that are the foundations of all the th all the things that we develop. But um, we are, I'm reminded on a constant basis, um, a for-profit company and we sell products. Um, so eventually all these technologies that, uh, that we develop are put into our products. And I'm sorry, does someone have a question? Just interrupt me. Um, anyway, so here's a here is the just sort of cover briefly the list of our products. We have uh, in what we call our intelligent bridging product line, Extreme Core. Um, I'll talk about that last actually. And we also have some new products, one that we call Silicon Disk, which is a, an actual storage product. Most of what we do is storage connectivity. We're mostly between the storage and the servers. We're on the wire, um, but uh, we've actually gotten into some specialty storage in some very particular cases. So I'm gonna run through some, uh, the, each of the different product lines and, and then feel free to introduce uh, questions as we go here. Um, starting with SaaS, this is um, this is very traditional direct attached storage, uh, typically in the box server storage, but um, we also work on the enterprise external storage arrays, JBODs, RAID arrays, things like that. Um, we have a product line of host adapters, uh, fairly straightforward that we uh, would sell both in a host configuration, uh, initiator, as well as target mode drivers. So we'll work with our customers to integrate into a server as well as uh, specialty applications with OEMs to integrate as the front end of, of a storage array. Um, we do keep up with the latest technologies. We just introduced a line of PCIe Gen 4 uh, products to align with what uh, AMD and Intel are doing. Uh, we're starting to, we believe that um, we'll start to see PCIe Gen 4 become much more, uh, much more prevalent here in the next few months since uh, Intel, I think, cross your fingers, um, is finally getting in the game. As we all know, AMD has been been uh, in Gen 4 for quite some time, uh, but I think the data center will start to adopt it now that, that Intel is there. We do see 24 gig as an important step and we are committed to it. 
uh, for those of you who uh, are an analyst for the uh, SaaS world or, or write about the SaaS world, um, 24 gig is definitely going to be something that we're going to get involved in. Uh, and uh, we see it probably in the next uh, two years becoming uh, much more of, a, of an important technology. We're already starting the development, but at the same time, we don't see it come to market for at least a couple of years, um, uh, at least in any great number. I'm going to take a pause here for any questions that you might have. All right. One well, of the it looks like everyone's clear. Yeah, one of the things that uh, I do get asked a lot is, yeah, go ahead, please. No, I think I think we're good, actually. Okay. Yeah, one of the things I do get asked a lot is, um, uh, what about twenty four gig uh, at end twenty four gig endpoints? Um, we see twenty four gig mostly as as a wire technology. Whether or not it ever gets the drives, um, who knows? But still, it's going to be important for. Uh, for the connections between uh, host and the storage. The brand name for our fiber channel host adapter product line is Celerity. Um, we've done fiber channel for quite some time that uh, we've been in it since the beginning of the technology, beginning of the technology almost 20 years ago. Same as SAS, we do both initiator and target mode. Uh, so we support a uh, fiber channel on both sides of the wire. Um, we have also uh, just released a line of Gen 4 cards to support the latest servers, um, as well as support for 32 gigabit fiber channel. Um, I don't know what you folks are seeing, but we are definitely seeing that, that 16 gigabit fiber channel is where the market is today and probably will be for some time. Um, but sometime over the coming year or two years, uh, it'll it'll evolve. We definitely see 32 gig as, as the technology that's getting adopted um, in the server world here in the next year or so. Just out of curiosity, how do you see the long-term vision for fiber channel? Uh, if I could, if I had a crystal ball, uh, I think fiber channel is going to continue to grow. Um, I think when when you look at um, Ethernet, and we're in both the Ethernet and fiber channel worlds, so we we play in both both ponds, so to speak. Um, Ethernet is a wonderful technology; it's ubiquitous, but the security and the deterministic latencies that you get with fiber channel, um, Ethernet probably will never be able to get there with those, even with RDMA and that kind of technology. So we think Fiber Channel has a place and will have a place for a very long time. Would you disagree? I think that it has a place, but the question is how big a place is that going to be in the future as um, more and more workloads can be satisfied without the very special characteristics that Fiber Channel delivers. So that's where there's the debate. Will it be needed for some workloads? Absolutely how big a proportion of all workloads will that be is an interesting question. Yeah, that's it's very similar to our perspective. Um, you know, we've seen markets that were very heavily invested in fiber channel and that's changed a little bit. Um, we've also seen uh, folks uh, who've started, who are, you know, continue to be committed to it. So really it's just a matter of us keeping the, an eye on which markets are, are adopting and continuing to use it. Um, yeah, I was, part, but, but, sorry, I was just going to jump in just to say potentially depending on also, you know, where, you know, we're getting information. Um, I mean, I did sit at, sit in on a FCIA presentation yesterday and they sit, well, as you would imagine, right, uh, they seem very bullish about the technology going forward. They had some statistics that they had shared uh, in terms of what the intent is for adoption, continued adoption in the market. And it was, you know, looked very promising. So, but to, to Pete's point, we don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, from what we've seen and what our customers are telling us, you know, it's, it's in, in line with what Pete was just saying. Okay, thank you. Uh, I got Bertrand Gear from Paris. Uh, I got a question. The, this attachment to, uh, to Faber channel, is it from uh, clearly uh, by the intrinsic uh, qualities of fiber channel as uh, to be dropless and so on? And do you see some specific uh, vertical sectors 
that are tied to a fiber channel because of it? Uh, sure. Um, interesting question. Good question. Um, so in terms of the verticals, uh, we find it primarily driven by needs. Uh, folks who uh, folks who are running databases, which is more of a horizontal market than a vertical market, but databases that are very latency sensitive, um, very much uh, are committed to fiber channel because they can't handle the latencies bouncing all over the place and, and fiber channel will give them that. Um, folks who have uh, intense security concerns uh, will very much rely on fiber channel uh, because fiber channel, as we all know, locks down security and hardware more so than software, like you would find in Ethernet. Um, and they just can't afford to, uh, to sort of throw their security out into the wild. So uh, those are the types of customers that we see who are, who are committed to, to fiber channel. Yeah, we, we've also seen um, an increase in the last uh, probably two years, um, kicking in a lot because of the uh, advancement in solid state disk technology for the enterprise world. Because now, you know, you're no longer dealing with disk drives that have, um, you know, tens of microseconds, uh, you know, or hundreds of microseconds. Uh, of latency. Now you're talking about things that are, you know, five, 10 microseconds. And so, you know, the more latency that's reduced out of the storage segment, the more, uh, the better advantage the fiber channel plays in those categories as well. Yeah. And just to add on top of that, so fiber channel, you can think of it as a transport, whether it's running SCSI packets over that transport or NVMe for that matter. Um, in fact, you're, you will see more NVMe uh, fiber channel NVMe going forward to support what Tim just said, you know, these uh, fast silicon drives. So. Yeah, we don't well, have it on. Go ahead. Well, thank you for the Just Pete real quick. There, there was a, there was a comment from Alex um, uh, about FC and, and NVMe over fabric um, for fiber channel. Um, so we do support NVMe over fiber channel. I'm interested in, in where you're seeing the applications for that. Yeah. Um, Randy, so a number of our clients have gone there primarily because it dramatically reduces server busy time. And that's been a big win for them that now all of a sudden now they get maybe 50% of their server computational capabilities back when they go to NVMe over, over fiber channel. Okay, so, so it's mainly CPU utilization for IOPS-based environments? Correct. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, this is near and dear to my heart um, because we're just running some uh, FC NVMe uh, benchmarks in our, in our lab here. I have some of my guys running those right now and and we're seeing some fantastic IOPS numbers with very low CPU utilization. And um, look for, I think we're gonna come out with a tech brief very shortly on that. Yeah, we have a test lab, obviously, and we test products all the time. And this is really a big deal. And I don't think a lot of people really understand the impact of server busy time in the protocol overhead. And certainly the response time's a big deal, which you guys already talked about. But sure. Um, there's not a lot, enough people that really understand the server busy part of this. Yeah, I mean, Randy, I, I, I think you mentioned that you have some of our adapters in your lab. I, I'd be happy to get you the software to enable um, NVMe over fiber channel if you, if you guys want to do some additional testing. Absolutely. Send it to us. That'd be great. All right. I am making a note right now. Thanks, Thanks. Tim. Just a quick no observation problem. here from Alex. It, 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 I worked for NetApp for a number of years, and where we were beginning to see, um, shortly before I left, IOPS rates that were solely the preserve of what I would call lab rats. You know, basically, you had to screw together really specialized configurations to get anyone <laughs> like the IOPS that we were demonstrating really easily with NVMe over fiber channel. I mean, it was it was it's astonishing, absolutely <clears throat> astonishing. You know, IOPS rates in the millions. Yeah, I, I concur, Alex. You know, I can I can go 
tweak a server in the lab with SPDK and do all these fancy things to get an IOPS number that's not real world. But I mean, the, the numbers that we're getting in the lab right now, are, are they're just fantastic. So, and NetApp is one of the customers that we're talking right now to about FCNVMA. So interesting. Can I just jump in? Um, I'd like to read a comment that Enrico has made. Enrico Signoretti is from GigaOM. Um, and he was saying fiber channel will remain relevant because the refresh cycle of directors is five to seven years. You keep buying HBAs because you have, I'm assuming you mean the director there, and then you buy a new director because you have the infrastructure. He's director switch. I'm, I'm yep. sure that's what he's talking about. Yeah, that is a good point. Yes. That's and, and that's what makes an ongoing market, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, the director switch. I yeah, we're continuing. I mean, obviously here we have 64 gigabit fiber channel on our on our roadmap. We're investing money in it. We see that it has a runway that'll continue for quite some time here and, and we're heavily invested in it. Um, you know, part of it, Randy, I think you made an interesting comment. Part of this is um, in some ways making uh, performance available to the masses. Um, you say, you know, there's these lab rats that create these really crazy configurations. A lot of the things that we like to do is to be able to get that performance into a much more uh, uh, everyday type of, of scenario. You know, we have tools that help people that, that make it less confusing for, for people to be able to get the top performance. Our products are just built so that they give you the performance out of the box instead of having to you know, get some guy who twiddles with it and, and, you know, spends a week trying to get this top performance. That's, that's part of what we do in our everyday product development. Yeah. From, from the company standpoint of view. So, uh, you know, myself and the other co-founder, we came out of uh, the mini computer world. And um, one of the, we were right there at the end of the eighties, early nineties, when everything was moving to, you know, the workstation world, right. And the suns and Apollos and, and all that stuff. Boy, I'm dating myself, aren't I? Um, <laughs> but, but one of the big things that we looked at as we started our company is how do we take these high performance things that we were building up in the mini computer world and bring it, uh, I'll call it uh, downscale into workstation environments for those applications that, that really need high performance storage um, yeah. connectivity. So I switched the slide here and we can always come back to fiber channel, but um, I switched the slides to talk about our, our fast frame product line, which is our ethernet product line. Um, we're across the board with ethernet. We, we don't get down into the, the dirty one gigabit world, but um, we see a significant amount of our market in 10 gigabit right now, but it's certainly moving to 25, 40 uh, is still a strong contender in our marketplace. Um, but we do see people in some, in some instances moving up to, to 100. And, and we will continue to support uh, Ethernet all the way into 200, 400, and wherever it goes here. We uh, handle Ethernet, both your more run-of-the-mill applications, your average applications, but we're also working with some uh, forward-looking technologies like RDMA, as Ken talked about, uh, uh, NVMe over fabrics. Uh, so we're absolutely looking at those forward technologies to, to sort of uh, squeeze ethernet even further and get more performance and also get it uh, so that latency, uh, ethernet can become a less latency sensitive uh, transport technology. So this is the first product I'm going to present here that is that is on the cusp. Uh, this is something where we are just um, uh, just announcing. Uh, so this is relatively new. What we're finding is that uh, servers, uh, servers that AMD, Intel, Supermicro, others are releasing, still have a very limited number of NVMe slots. It's great for a boot drive. It's great for a little bit of internal storage. But if you really want to build out a server with some high performance NVMe storage, the tools just don't exist today. So what we did is we built an NVMe adapter um, and this gives you uh, 32 lanes of NVMe that you can connect to, you know, 
uh, you can connect to six, eight, uh, uh, six or eight NVMe drives, and you can really get uh, quite a bit of NVMe storage. Um, we think it helps solve the, the density issue, uh, the limited number of, of PCIe slots. This gives you uh, a way to connect a lot of NVMe storage to a single uh, PCIe slot and fixes that um, problematic, uh, the problem with, with NVMe that it's not scalable. We're, we're truly making it scalable without sacrificing performance. And that's really what this NVMe adapter is. It's a PCIe to NVMe adapter, switch-based. I, I always start out uh, with Thunderbolt to say, um, how many of you folks actually deal with Thunderbolt? Uh, just a quick, quick survey here. Th nope. I, I see Kimberly shaking her head. <laughs> 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 yeah, Thunderbolt is something that we get involved in just a lot of it because of some vertical markets that we're strong in. Um, uh, we do... Uh, we have a lot of vertical markets that we cover. One of them is uh, uh, video uh, post-production. And a lot of those folks uh, are using systems that have, they're looking for a way to bring high performance storage into the mobile computing world. And the way they do that is with Thunderbolt. Um, it's a technology developed by Intel and, and Apple together. Um, it has worked its way into the Windows world for mobile computing. What we do, though, is we, we make some, uh, some adapters that allow you to connect your Thunderbolt to local uh, SaaS storage connected into Ethernet networks. So essentially, we're, we're linking the mobile network with the data center network with these Thunderbolt adapters. I think um, just, just one little customer use case that you know, is kind of outside the box um, so, so, so we have several large customers that are currently using these Thunderbolt adapters um, to connect to either fiber channel or Ethernet backend storage. And on like Mac minis or uh, Mac pros. And what they're doing is they're spinning up VMs of instances of OS 10. And these code developers are, are coming in and, and they're running builds for their applications for iOS or the iPad or something like that on our products. So as compared to the competitive products with Thunderbolt, as Tim and Pete have alluded to, we really focus on performance. So it wasn't megabytes a second or IOPS that mattered to those large customers. It was really build times for their software. So that's where you know real world application testing is very important to our customers. And that's where we can really differentiate Addo from, from some of our competition. Yeah. Yeah, that DevOps world. Yeah, it's more DevOps, yeah. And next slide up here is our intelligent bridge product line. Uh, I think you might all be familiar with, with what is bridging. Essentially, it is a protocol translator. So you're translating from SaaS to Ethernet or fiber channel to SaaS. Um, but most of the time when you see these in the industry, they are pretty low performance and they're software based. Uh, you're essentially taking a server and you're putting a couple adapters in it. And, uh, you know, you have IO coming in one side the CPU processes it, and then it sends it out the back end of your storage. Pretty inefficient and pretty slow. What we've done is we've essentially built uh, a line of intelligent bridges, which are hardware-based. We eliminate software as much as we can so that when you're using high-performance protocols like SaaS and 40 gigabit Ethernet, you're actually getting, again, that bandwidth and that latency, that predictable latency that you expect out of those protocols. And that's what the this extreme core product line is. It's a line of intelligent bridges that are based on an FPGA design. So we take all of that protocol translation and we move it into, move it into this high performance hardware. We bridge a couple different ways right now. We bridge from ethernet to SAS. We also bridge from fiber channel to SAS. Um, but we are looking at some, some different technologies and I'll actually talk about uh, a couple of those here in a second. 
earlier, there were some questions on the chat about uh, about FPGAs and, and what we do with them. Tim mentioned earlier that we do work with a variety of different um, controller vendors. Uh, so we do source uh, run of the mill or, or best of breed, I should say controllers, but we also do FPGA development because our feeling is that we can bring flexibility and performance with FPGAs um, that otherwise is unachievable. Um, so we built what we call an X -core, our X-Core acceleration engine, and that is the foundation of, of our Extreme Core product line. So we're taking an FPGA. In some cases, we're actually bringing the NIC uh, into the FPGA um, as opposed to having a separate controller. And also we're bringing that SAS, instead of having a separate SAS host adapter, we're bringing that all into the FPGA. As I mentioned, everything is done in hardware and you get some incredible performance out of it. Um, this is a design that we use, and I can't remember, I'm sorry, but somebody said they were from NetApp. This is a design that um, NetApp has adopted uh, years ago for their Metro cluster application. So this is, this is in tens of thousands of data centers around the world. So the slide I just pulled up is our silicon disk. Tim said uh, our company started with the silicon disk product line. Um, we absolutely uh, are still committed to um, high performance storage. This isn't a connectivity product. This is actually a storage product. What we've done on the right side, you can see that pyramid. Um, we're actually creating a new tier of storage because what we're finding is there are folks who actually need uh, high performance the, the performance that's as good as if it was local, but they need it shareable and they need it networked. They need to be able to put this high performance storage anywhere on their network. And that's what Silicon Disk does. It allows you to get um, a, massive, um, a massive amount of IOPS, uh, very high uh, level of sustained throughput, um, all at a sub microsecond response time, sub microsecond latency. So essentially you're getting latencies that are that are as good as, or in some cases better than as if you had local storage, but you're able to put it out on your network and share it wherever you want. How are you taking this to market? Are you selling it directly or are you going to essentially um, ODM it via um, more traditional storage vendors? Uh, both actually. Uh, there's both an OEM as well as a, a channel uh, market for us. How does it connect to servers, please? Uh, we have, so it's configurable, but it has 400 gigabit ethernet ports on the front end that can connect either directly to your hosts or it can connect through a switch. And it's using the NVMe over fabric communications protocol. Thank you. You're welcome. What is your channel partner group look like? I mean, what kind of channel partners are they? I'm going to kick that over to Tim because I think Tim can best answer that question. Yeah. So um, we we have uh, we have two different types of uh, channel partners. So we have people that are special um, markets. I'll call them. Um, so those would be specific application market. Um, as I said, VARs and VADs, um, but we also have um, a few um, that are, are more enterprise-oriented um, uh, resellers, system integrators, uh, that type of environment. Um, not a lot, um, but uh, they are a few that we have worked with uh, in the past. The, the primary the primary target for this product is to go to um, I'm going to call them uh, um, those application engineering uh, engineered product companies um, that are looking for hey how do I take this and, and boost this type of performance um, from a solution set that's what we have today. How much capacity does a silicon disk have, please? So this, this product is just being released and it's being released in a half a terabyte form factor, but we have a roadmap uh, over the next couple of quarters to bring it up to a terabyte and multiple terabytes. Ooh. Tim, this is Randy. Uh, wouldn't this also be a major target for SIs that want to build more specialized systems? Mm -hmm. 
It is. Yeah, it is. Tim, go ahead. Yes, yes, it is. It, it's it's definitely, um, um, you know, it's really interesting because this is a very similar product to what we started our company on. And, you know, uh, we actually got out of this business probably about 14, 15 years ago. Um, and now with the new interfaces, it reopens that whole new category. So um, for specialty system integrators, you know, this is, this is, um, how do you want to say, um, um, it, it's not a general product, right? So, so people aren't just going to be able to take this and say, well, I'm just going to plug it in my system and um, do this, right? The system integrator type of, of com customers that really know like, hey, I want to put these files over here because that's where I'm going to get my highest performance out of it, right? Or, or I have these, you um, uh, AI data instances that I need to be able to, you know, download quickly, or um, we have some uh, uh, security companies that are talking about, hey, I got all these cameras and the problem is, is I can't write them fast enough, right? Uh, 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 so I need to be able to bring it into a device so that I can get them off the cameras quickly onto storage so that I can then move on to the next phase, right? Um, so, so those type of, of specialty system integrators, um, that know what they want to be able to do and where they want to put it, those would be the type of targets that we're, we're lining up for this product. Um, not really a generic, you know, hey, Mr. IT guy, you know, plug it in and see what it does for you. Right. Given your 14, 15 year gap in this particular market segment, um, do you have enough awareness in there or are you going to be actively promoting yourself? We're starting all over from scratch in that segment, right? Uh, people don't know. Actually, it's 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 really interesting. It was this was uh, RAM based solid state disks were really hot because there was no such thing as flash, right? Um, and uh, what happened was the interfaces themselves um, were slower than than what you saw on the the products here, and the flash market started to eating into that. Right, uh, which is uh, why we basically said, look, we're going to get out of this market because Flash is so much less expensive um, than doing RAM-based uh, type products like this. Well, you know, as as all the new NVMe SSDs and all that came out, um, and things are getting faster, and now the interfaces are able to support very, very low latency and and very fast interfaces. Um, this new category of RAM-based storage um, creates a, a whole new environment, which is, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of like in our industry, right? It, you know, first it's parallel, and then it's serial, and then they, hey, let's 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 take the mul multiple serials and make it parallel, and then no, let's go back and forth, right? And and disaggregated, no, let's aggregate it, no, no, let's disaggregate it, right? So so you know. Um, uh, you know, being around for a long time, it's kind of like, it's kind of like some of my ties, you know, if you just leave them in the closet long enough, you know, some of the technology comes back around, right? Well, this is the time for this because people are, are plugging SSDs in, you know, going, okay, wow, that's a big, that's a big jump from a hard drive to an SSD drive. Well, when you plug one of these in, it's another big jump from an SSD drive to, to the silicon disk. So it, it's really interesting. Do you think you, people might confuse you with the non-volatile memory um, elements as well and where you fit into that pyramid? Yeah. Yes, yes. So um, as part of this design, um, we also have, um, there's actually a backup capability in this as well. So uh, if, if power is lost, we can actually um, save all the data off to flash memory, right, as a, as a component in there. Um, so... Yes, that is one of the things because it's new, you know, people are, are kind of going, okay, well, it's not flash. And, you know, I know what an SSD is now because before we, we had to tell people what a solid state disk was, right? I mean, people were like, you know, okay, so we used to compare to a RAM disk. Okay, it's kind of, kind of like a RAM disk, but you got to take it outside of the system, right? Um, and now we're kind of uh, going, okay, well, it's, it's not a RAM disk, right? But it's like a RAM disk, but it's it's like a, a, a SSD, but it's not flash, it, it sits in here, right? So so explaining that pyramid is is one of the things that uh, we're, we've got to go and do some market education again, right? Yeah. It's a non-trivial challenge. 
It absolutely is. It absolutely is. I think so, so. get it, get it, right? So could I ask, did you think about building a silicon disk full of octane chips? Yeah. We did. Um, it was actually one of the options that we had considered. And what we found is that uh, the performance wasn't what we thought it could be. Uh, so we actually went down a different path. As in slower? Correct. We, uh, yeah, we actually compare ourselves uh, to the, we compare ourselves to the Optane pers uh, persistent storage. Uh, mm -hmm. And we actually uh, bench uh, better against it. Okay, could you use the silicon disk to provide a server with more memory than it could physically attach through its own sockets? This is not addressable memory. Um, this is storage. Ah. Yeah. So, yeah, we purposely made it, and, and, and that goes back to the earlier question. Yes, there is some fuzziness between these two markets, especially when you have somebody like Intel out there who is pushing Optane as both a memory, addressable memory product and a storage product. They have both versions of it. This fits on the storage side, not the addressable memory. So does it provide storage blocks like an SSD? Correct. Correct. It's a block Correct. storage device. Yep. Uh -huh. Looks Which, like a drive, acts like a drive, has hmm. multiple you know, connect, very fast connections into it. Um, it's just much, much faster. Okay. Do you have a price for it? It depends. It depends on the. Uh, it depends on how many terabytes that we put in there. But you're looking comparatively. You're looking at you know the ten thousand dollar ranges there. So you, you do. Gig. What's that? A five hundred gig. Five hundred terabytes. C correct yeah gig, gig. gigs yeah 500 terabytes that'd be impressive <laughs> ten thousand dollars for 500 gig thank we you we have we haven't announced pricing on this yet that's just to give you an idea of where we're where we're positioning it yeah when you did your testing internally against the optane dims mm -hmm. memory um, what were you, what use case were you, what, what application were you running? What were you, what were you doing? Was that strictly a? Uh, it was a straight up speed run uh, as opposed yeah. to against a, that? correct. Not an application. Yeah, so, yeah, so like FIO testing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's actually one of the things that we want to, uh, we want to uh, embed ourselves in with a couple uh, different customers uh, who can do specific application testing because we do recognize that um, networks and applications at another level of um, uncertainty and and complexity to this and we need to make sure that um, that performance that you can get out of a raw drive extends all the way through the network and the application layers. Hey, Pete, real quick. I'm sorry to interrupt, just to say, uh, is there anything here that we're talking about that is under embargo? Um, if you could just clarify any anything that is, thank you. Yeah, the only thing I talked about that uh, that has not been released officially is pricing. Just, you know, I gave you an idea of where we think it'll hit the market, but we just haven't confirmed that with, there's okay. nothing though that I would say that is embargoed. Is there a connection between this device and direct GPU storage. So potentially could be um, because we are we are moving uh, data in a an RDMA type of uh, environment. So yes, this could all be pieced together in, in certain applications. Yeah, Chris, I, I would definitely say yes to that because everything's block addressable storage. So, you know, you're just going to use the RDMA transport to get the data to the device. Yes. Somebody ought to be interested in that a lot. We agree with you. <laughs> you, could, you could talk to Weka Io maybe. Yeah, Weka's hey. got an interesting, uh, interesting um, file system that uh, I think fits mm -hmm. well with this. Um, let me just interject also here that if anyone would like to follow up uh, and get more details and information about this particular product, uh, please, uh, we can do that uh, afterwards as well, um, either in a chat or, you know, we could follow up certainly, you know, whether it's this week or next week, uh, we can provide more details and information. 
uh, beyond maybe what you're getting today. So just to keep that in mind. Yeah. Thank you. The other, and I'm going to turn this over to Ken here in a second, that just the last thing I'll finish up with is um, we, t we do tend to work with um, uh, OEMs and we customize a lot of, a lot of our products. So um, we're very flexible. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're able to bring a product like Silicon Disk to market. Um, as we all know, Intel is a big company. They need a lot of gas in that engine to drive the revenues that they need to survive. We're a different kind of company. So we can bring Silicon Disk in, uh, to market and work very closely with application vendors, with channel partners, and make a product like this successful. So some of the you know, the confusion that you bring up between persistent memory and storage, some of the, um, the you know, well, what do I do with this new tier of storage? Those are answers that we can um, provide in a very intimate way to the market that a larger company like Intel may struggle with. And I presume you've got the ability and the supply chains in place already to ramp this up as demand grows? We do, yeah. All right. Um, with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, to Ken Cyber. Ken is manager of our customer engineering uh, team. He works very uh, very closely with our customers, uh, engineer by training, um, but we also let him talk to customers, uh, which you'll find he's uh, he's a great mm. guy and and will give you very honest answers. Thanks, so Dave. Ken. So the first use case here, um, we talked about our products. Um, this is the Extreme Core 8200T. Um, this is a specialized product that basically, if you think of it um, simply, it connects SAS tape libraries or SAS tape drives up to an Ethernet network. Now that allows, that allows folks in data centers to do some very interesting things. Um, so now they can attach their, you know, high-end tape libraries up to their Ethernet networks where they used to have to pay top dollar for a fiber channel tape drive. Um, it also allows them to scale. Um, one of the other advancements that we have is we put in this bridge something called ACLs. And I, I know you've heard a lot of acronyms. So access control lists. So I can actually have an iSCSI target or an ICER target or a server um, talk to specific tape drives for backups. Um, this is certified by a number of large tape manufacturers like HP, Quantum, NEC, Spectrologic. Um, and, and this is public knowledge. So um, the Spectrologic Swarm is the Addo Extreme Core 8200T. So their data center Ethernet attached um, T9500 libraries are based upon um, Addo technology, Extreme Core technology. So that, that, that's pretty interesting. Those are the giant tape libraries that are out there. Um, pretty interesting. <laughs> um, he, for, for the folks that... Uh, I Out think, of curiosity, Ken. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Quantum is doing a huge amount of work with the hyperscalers with their, their libraries. Do you know mm -hmm. if, that's, if they're, they're using you for that primarily? Or... <clears throat> adapting because they, you know, they've traditionally been Ethernet folks up there. Yeah. So, so we, we, we are under NDA with quantum. So we are actively doing work with quantum. Um, I cannot share what we're doing right okay. now. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> um, we have certified the 8200 with all their libraries though, if that gives you any sort of inclination that I can tell you. So here is another extreme core. Um, this is our 7600. So this one goes from fiber channel to SAS. Um, this is the heart of the NetApp metric cluster, um, as Peter mentioned before. So you have your, your SDS appliance, uh, HA head, and a fiber channel backend. Um, what we find is this is a, a great solution for asynchronous backups across the um, across a Metro HA area, so up to 50 kilometers. Um, and this is a high volume product. I think Tom jumped in earlier. Um, we sell tens of thousands of these. Um, so this, is, this has been a great product, a very solid product. And one of the things that, that we talked about is partnerships with companies. Um, 
NetApp actually came to us and said, hey, we, we, have, this, we have this need, um, can you help us? So we had bridging technology, um, we got our engineering teams together, we went through a full development cycle, and these 7,600 bridges actually talk directly to NetApp filers. So really great program. NetApp's been a great customer for many years. And, you know, that, that's a very large IT presence for Ada. That fun word, disaggregation. Um, so dynamic disaggregation. This is the 7550. So this is another fiber channel to SAS bridge. Um, what makes this interesting is in environments where you want to add lots of 12 gig SAS JBODs, um, we can actually map those JBODs to different server hosts. So one application um, that I can think of quickly, um, if a customer you know, has a server fail, uh, a data store needs to be vMotion to another server in VMware, you can either vMotion it over ethernet, which will take a long period of time, or you can remap those drives and that data store to another server. So this is something that we've tested with uh, VMware. Um, it's VMware certified, and it's uh, something we offer our customers. So basically, you know, it provides you instant remapping of drives to different servers. And all those bridges have the acceleration technology that we talked about with the X-Core engine. Um, the 8200, the first one that I talked about, um, actually has a TCP IP stack in hardware. So we, we've done a lot with these FPGAs with acceleration technology. Tim mentioned this, so I'll, I'll go over this one quickly. A multipath director, we had a large vendor come to us. Um, geez, it had to be 10 or 12 years ago. That vendor was HP. Um, HP had a need to connect enterprise class storage to Windows, Mac workstations at the time. Um, so there is no multi-pathing built into workstation class operating systems. And these customers needed and high performance. So we built out a driver set um, that supported Mac OS X, Windows, and Linux. Um, we then updated those drivers to run in server OSs also and tested those in, in many environments. And what's, what, what sets Addo's multipath director apart from other solutions is that it's the same algorithms across multiple operating systems. So whether it be a Windows workstation or a Red Hat workstation or a, or a SUSE server, you're going to have the same failover capabilities and, and the same algorithms. So you're not moving ones on storage between controllers. We found this to be a huge issue in the field when you have multi-vendor setups um, where a, you know, one controller will say, okay, you need to move these ones from controller A to controller B. And then the other controller comes up and says, no, move them from B to A. So it's called the ping pong effect. Um, and this eliminates that. Um, there's a nice GUI that we have for this. Um, so we've made it very easy for users to look at multi-pathing, um, see path data, statistics, things like that. We also provide uh, full CLI tools um, for this. And, and finally, uh, I'd like to you know, cite one customer real quick. Schlumberger is a, a customer of ours and, and they use our, our multi-path director in Linux. Um, they found that multipath directors error recovery um, was much better than what was built into Linux with device mapper. So um, they move forward with Addo's adapters and, and they're using them today. Target mode. This is another interesting application. So basically our fiber channel or SAS HPAs can be turned into a target port. Um, we do a number of things here. So full data um, access. So you have full control via our SDK to control the data. Um, so you would take SSDs or SAS drives and present those out either fiber channel or SAS. Another interesting application here um, would be security. Um, we worked with Unisys on a, a stealth project and they needed to encrypt all the, all the data on the back end. So 
you know, we gave them the target interface, they brought the data into the controller, they did their encryption and then sent it off to disk. So this is another um, application that Addo's worked very closely with our OEMs. Um, one of the newer things that we're bringing to target mode, um, which I think is pretty impressive because no one else really supports this today. Um, we are taking physical ports and you know how you have NPIV for an initiator mode. Well, we're now allowing NPIV target ports. So I could turn one physical port of fiber channel into 16 independent fiber channel ports to the fiber channel world. So forward facing. So that, that's a kind of an innovation that we're currently working on. Um, and that was another customer request. So, you know, always, always willing to work closely with our customers. All right, and Addo 360, uh, now we're gonna go into the demo. So it's, it's a tuning um, analytics and monitoring um, software package. Um, this package runs on Addo's FastFrame Smart NICs. It also will show other vendors' NICs, um, but you will not have access to any of the information that you can get directly from our FastFrame NICs. Um, currently, um, customer would go out buy a FastFrame adapter, um, install it in their server or in their workstation, download Addo 360 for free. Uh, did I mention free? And they would have access to all this uh, all this software, which is which is really nice. And and I'm going to give you guys a quick demo right now. Is that up? Yep. What's up? Great. Thank you. So when you launch Addo 360, um, we talked about, I talked a little bit about our layered approach to ethernet. Um, so we wanna keep it very simple for, for users that aren't very technical, but we also want a tool for network engineers. And, you know, I'll give two, two polar opposite examples. Um, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't make it any bigger. Um, two, two polar opposite examples. First, you have your customer that's uh, a video editor, uh, a person that works in Adobe Premiere or Avid. Um, they get paid for creating content, editing video. Um, and then you have your network engineer who wants to dig down to the memory and the socket level. Um, I've worked in the lab with some of our, our folks here at Addo. And we've had, you know, 15 terminal windows open. We're looking at all sys control. We got Wireshark traces running, you know. So we're really analyzing the network. But we tried to make a product that would really help all of our customers um, with our smart NICs. So here you can see the, the basics of, of Addo 360. You can see what operating system you're running, CPU, firewalls, um, if they're enabled or not. Some, some very simple things. But we do have ability to change buffer sizes. Um, so these are send and receive buffers for, for more advanced users. Um, pretty basic an IP uh, routing table. Um, SMB signing is encryption for SMB. 360 view we'll talk about last. So that's a real simplistic view of, of what's going on with uh, Addo 360. Next, you will have we're gonna take it down a, a layer. This is NIC information. And what you see here um, is the interface information um, for each NIC in your server or workstation or device. And you see current PCI width, and, and, and you'll understand why this is all important when we get to the diagnostics. Um, MAC address, driver version, you see all this stuff here, it's all grayed out. Well, that's because this is an onboard interface. It's not an Addo fast frame NIC. If I just click that right there, you will see that, wow, we get a lot more information. I can see the Addo model. I can see the PCIe generation. I can see that I'm linked up with all 16 PCIe lanes. Um, well, let's just see what the transceiver information is. So I can see that this is a passive copper connection. So for a, for a data center administrator, this is a nice tool. You know, They can go out, troubleshoot SFPs, um, and, and we use all this information for our diagnostics. Here's down here, we have some offloads. So a lot of these uh, 
a lot of these uh, offloads are common. Uh, we implement these offloads a little bit differently than some folks. And these are all hardware offloads, by the way. And you have full capability of, of changing these. So large receive offloads for reads, TSO, writes, um, flow control. So that's just basically something that tells the, the sender or the receiver you're busy. Um, striding RQ is something we just added to the application and it, it's pretty interesting. Um, if the receiver is getting lots of packets, we throw them in this large buffer so we can just queue them all up and service them. Um, so we're not causing as many interrupts, really increases performance. You can change MTU size, you know, all, all the basic stuff. So now I'm gonna drill down another layer because I'm, I'm a network engineer, right? So I wanna go and say, okay, for, EN7, I want to see, I'm having a problem on that interface. Well, I can see all layer four statistics. So I get all the information that comes from our hardware counters and our driver counters. And all that information is placed in here for interface statistics. So I can see things like, you know, size of the packets that are coming through, if they're good packets, if they're malformed packets, CRC errors. I mean, I can, I can take this down very tech to a very technical level. I can even, you know, I can, if, if I really want to, I can look at our rings, our, our ring buffers. I can look at our memory mapping. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff here. Now, if you're even more of a network engineer, um, you can go down to this level. And what we found was when you're diagnosing a network issue, I don't need to look at everything. You know, I have these 15 windows open to look at one thing out of one window, one thing out of another, and uh, one thing out of the third. And I want to correlate those three things. So what we've done is we've taken uh, this window and I can, you know, I can take protocol, send buffer used, and, and there's a lot of parameters here. And I could look at only the things I want to look at for a particular socket. So these are all sockets. So this is pretty in-depth stuff. Um, I don't know of any other manufacturer that gives you this information for free. Um, there are packages out there that you can purchase to do this, but they cost thousands of dollars. We talked about simplicity for our users. Let's talk about tuning profiles. So I'm, a, I'm an end user and I just wanna send as much data as fast as I can. Okay, so I'll select this high throughput profile. I click that, I hit continue, and this automatically goes and sends all the things I need to set up for high throughput. Now, what we're doing here, um, obviously there's a lot of IP involved, but I can give you a generalization. We, we're changing sys controls, we're changing buffers in the driver, we're changing hardware counters. So we're, we're doing all sorts of things. And you, know, you can see we have a number of addo profiles here but we also talked about how we work with partners. Well, here's one of the partners we launched first, um, Dell, Isilon, one of us. So we have specific profiles for Dell technology storage um, and particularly their one of us file system. So we worked with them. Um, we had an F600 and H500 and F800 in here for months and months and months. And we did all this performance testing and created these profiles. And, you know, we showed them that we could give them 30% more performance in a lot of their um, M&E workflows and a lot of their medical imaging workflows where they're transferring large files. Um, we also, we talked about video manufacturers. So we have one here for Avid. Um, Avid's been a great customer of Atos for a long time. So this is an optimization for Avid. And as we continue to develop this tool, we're continuously adding features to it, more tuning profiles. And what I'm gonna get to right now is diagnostics. So I'm just gonna switch to another machine if I can. 
Just to recap, Ken, as you're switching screens here. Sure. So whether or not you are a total Ethernet geek and you want to look at the in-depth stuff, um, I'm mm -hmm. looking at you, Ken, um, or you just want to make, you, you don't know anything about this stuff and you just want a one button click just to make sure that you have the right settings, Addo 360 can do any of that stuff and either for the total dummy or the total geek or anybody in between. A absolutely, absolutely. Um, once we get through the diagnostics, I'll give you a, a quick customer example also. So here we have layer four statistics on another machine and there's all these values and I have no idea what they all mean. So we light up this diagnostic button here and I, I apologize, this is very small. But for a particular interface, um, I see a message here. Some RX packets are being dropped. This means the sender needs to enable flow control. So I took the data, I analyzed the data, and I've given the end user a message and told them how to fix their network. Um, there's also CRC, physical CRC errors. So that may indicate that we have a cable problem. Um, and also the third message here is that we've see, received packets that are too big. So the MTU size may need to be adjusted. I know on iSCSI networks, tons of customers don't set their switches up right. And they're sending 1500 MTUs and jumbos, and it causes all sorts of fragmentation and performance problems. Um, but you can see, we use all this data here, like the CRC errors to give customers diagnostics. So basically, when we get support calls or a customer comes to us with an issue, we take that data and we, we, we try to use that data to prevent that problem in the future. So I'll, I'll give you the example now. We have a customer in Qatar, um, and they're doing the World Cup soccer. Um, so they were doing performance testing for about three months. And, you know, they were testing this vendor storage, they're running into some issues, and they finally reached out to us, you know, because they were using our NICs, our smart NICs, fast frame smart NICs, and they finally reached out to us. So we sent them out of 360 and they said, okay, you know, I'm, I asked them for a diagnostic output and, and whatnot. And what we got from them, I'm going to show you right here. This is 360 view. So we have this thing called a time series database. So all that data you saw that the application was um, gathering, well, we're putting it in a time series database. So I can go look at specific packet traffic um, from the customer. I can see bytes transmitted. I can see if there's mismatched packets. I can see these errors. So I had them send me this and uh, come to find out, they were running out of something called MBUFFs, um, which is just memory structures for FreeBSD and OS X. And that was totally affecting their performance. That took a day. So three months of, of working with a POC, they couldn't get the performance they needed. They were working real hard. One day, installed that 360 uh, and, and they were so happy. And, it, and it's a great success story, but you know, I don't think they're going to let us use the World Cup of Soccer. <laughs> any, any questions about the graphing capability or the time series database? Because this is very new to the application. Um, as you can see, there's like a number of dashboards. Um, so we take what we put in the time series database and we're graphing it with a common tool called Grafana. And, um, you know, you can set up different dashboards. Like I said, we can look at different structures and, uh, Anything, anything that our drivers or our firmware or our hardware can collect, um, we can put in these time series databases. And that's what we're, th that's what we're doing on our, our appliance and bridging line also. So here's something very new. Um, this is a beta build actually, where we're looking at those MBUF structures and class allocation and, and very, very technical detailed information about the network. I always forget the easiest part though. <laughs> Before I end the demo, uh, so if I click here and I just hit this help button, see that there's a little run diagnostic that shows up there. So if I click that, 
it brings up a dialog box. I type in, you know, bad server, you know, or, you know, whatever I want to name the file. Uh, uh, and I hit save and it just goes off and, oh, well, not writable. Thanks, uh, OS 10. Um, it'll, it'll write the diagnostics information out to a file and they can send that to Addo support or one of our OEMs that uses Addo 360 to diagnose their network issues. So I know I kind of ran a little bit long there, so uh, I think uh, I'll pass it back to you folks. Okay, uh, so thanks, Ken, it was great. Uh, certainly this is another one of those tools that if people wanted to get more information on, we, we have videos available for that um, and we can certainly get you uh, copies of the software. Once again, it's optimized for our fast frame Ethernet uh, smart NICs. So uh, just mm -hmm. to keep that in mind. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> Fred, any uh, anything that you would want to uh, uh, interject I, at this point? I just wanted to, yeah, I just, I'm just curious. I wanted to see, and I don't mean this in a rude way, but I've been in the industry for over 20 years. And there are quite a few of you here who've been in the industry as long as I have been. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to I'm ask. I've been in the industry twice you, as long as you have been. <laughs> I know you would pipe up, Tony. There you go. <laughs> um, how many of you had spoken to Atto before? Not how many of you were familiar with the company. How many of you um, were you know, had spoken to the company before. I'm assuming that maybe Randy and Camberley, because you're in the US, maybe you are both. No, Camberley's a no. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I, Randy, I have it in my head that I did a long, long, long time ago. Yeah, I have, Fred. Right. And I'm sure that- You have. Our other people on our team have. Um, I just hadn't talked to them. Right. And Alex, you, I'm, you were I'm waving sorry. something. Yeah, Ulrika, yes. If they've been to the seabed at least once, I might have spoken to them. Ah, good uh, point. <laughs> yeah, we, we were at seabed uh, for many years. Yeah, I'm quite, I'm quite sure point, now. Ulrika, good point. This is really ages ago. I mean, I'm dating myself, you know, but this is really, really a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Alex, you were waving your hands at some point saying, was that in Yeah, in no, I've had, I've had dealings question? with uh, Atto Engineering way back at the beginning of Metro Cluster. Wow, okay. Yeah, that's um, a long time ago now. But it seems like even people who follow the industry closely um, have not had interaction with the company for quite a while. So I'm, I'm really pleased that um, we had Atto here today because it, uh, judging by the number of questions, you know, it sounds like there was a lot of interest in finding out more about what the company is doing. Um, oh, Hartmut is saying he also had um, an interaction with Atto, probably inter at an international conference, possibly in the US. <clears throat> Hartmut Via also being one of our German, um, more senior, um, a journalist, one of the more experienced one and knowledgeable in the industry. Uh, <clears throat> so this is really interesting, guys, because I was saying to my team, this is the kind of storage I cut my PR teeth on, you know, HBAs and NICs and fiber channel and all the stuff that has been around for a long time and which I find so interesting. So um, I would like to say thank you to, to the Atto team for putting together a really good group of uh, executives today for us to answer all the questions um we've in the in the chat we've been asked for more details uh, lisa and her team will be getting in touch to ask you to provide that um, information again to our guests thank you so much i know how thank hard you. it is to spend hours in front of the screen um right. taking in so much information and asking questions and uh so thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, right. We will hey, send hey, you the slides. Fred, real quick, yeah. uh, before you know, we wrap up here, and I'll probably turn over to Tim in just a minute, but 
Uh, for everyone who has uh, been participating again, this uh, was very great for us to hear some of your feedback. We would like and love to stay engaged uh, going forward, uh, which means that as we have you know, new, uh, new news, new technologies that we certainly would like to get that in front of you. And hopefully that is of interest to you as well. So uh, just want to let you know that we do want to stay engaged and we will be reaching out probably after this session over the next week or two. So Tim, anything uh, you want to add? I, I, I just want to, uh, you know, join you in, in thanking everybody too, because it, it was, uh, it was really good. We, we talked to a lot of people over here in the States and probably don't, uh, um, don't, do as much of uh, or as well of a job uh, talking to everybody overseas. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the time because it's, it gives us a different perspective and, and we do appreciate that. Um, and appreciate your time too. So thank you. Mm -hmm.